Church. And on behalf of our congregation, I want to welcome you all here. This is, this is an important conversation for us as Presbyterians, and I imagine for the rest of you as well. Uh, to those who are celebrating New Year, Happy New Year to you. Uh, we're honored to be hosting an interfaith conversation in the midst of the High Holy Days. Some of you have asked about our uh, sanctuary. If you'd like to see the sanctuary after the end of the program, it is open and the lights are on, and feel free to take a look. I will be here through the program. Of course, I want to hear what Yitzhak has to say and, and learn along with the rest of you. Uh, it is uh, seriously a wonderful pleasure for us at Westminster, and I see a, a, a number of our leaders in the room as well to, to welcome you here and to host this evening with the Center for Jewish Studies from the University. We're glad to be partnering with you and, and look forward to hopefully some more opportunities in the future. Now I'd like to introduce uh, the, the professor who will lead us in this uh, event to start us out, Leslie Morris, prof professor of German at the University and the, the director of the Center for Jewish Studies. Leslie. Well, I want to thank the Reverend Dr. Tim Hart Anderson and Westminster Presbyterian Church for hosting tonight's event. I also want to give a special thank you to the Reverend Dr. Gary Ryerson, colleague, friend, and advisory board member of the Center for Jewish Studies, who has not only made this talk tonight at Westminster possible, but who has tirelessly reached out to welcome the broader community. So I'm really thrilled to see you all here. It's really an honor for the Center for Jewish Studies at the university to be here tonight, and as you will see, a special treat for all of us to be able to welcome back Professor Yitzhak Reiter to the Twin Cities. Yitzhak Reiter is Professor of Islam, Middle East History and Politics, and Israel Studies. He chairs the Department of Israel Studies and is head of the Research Authority at Ashkelon Academic College. He is also a senior researcher at the Jerusalem Institute for Israel Studies and the Harry S. Truman Institute for Peace Research at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In addition to his appointment as visiting scholar at Emory this fall, he has also been visiting scholar at Oxford University, St. Anthony's College, the Middle East Uni Institute in Washington, D.C., and Sydney University. Professor Ryder is active in Track 2 diplomacy meetings on the Arab-Israeli conflict and in Jewish-Arab relations inside Israel, and is frequently interviewed in the Israeli media for his expertise in these areas. He is the author of 13 books, and I'm not going to list all of the titles, and also the editor or the co-editor of five additional volumes um, and numerous articles. But I want to mention his most recent books, um, including Contested Holy Places in Israel-Palestine, Sharing and Conflict Resolution that came out in 2017 with Rutledge, and The Eroding Status Quo, Power Struggles on the Temple Mount, uh, that also was published in 2017. His talk tonight is entitled Sharing Sacred Spaces in Jerusalem Between Contestation and Tolerance. Please join me in welcoming Yitzhak Reiter. Thank you, thank you, Leslie, for this generous uh, introduction. I will put you in my will as the uh, speaker in my eulogy. Um, it is, uh, don't worry also about my 13 books. Each of them was read by eight, 11 people, including my family and the three members of the promotion committee. Um, I would like to thank also the Westminster Town Hall and the Board of Trustees and the Reverend and Pastor and the Organizer Jewish Studies Center, uh, Professor Leslie Morris and Nathan pa Dr. Da Nathan Paradise, and the audience here that you come today uh, to uh, listen to, my, to what I have to say. Uh, tonight I would like to share with you some thoughts concerning my research on shared holy places in Jerusalem and the Holy Land. 
what interests me in, in this topic is to study what prevents the outbreak of violence in holy places and what could promote tolerance in shared holy places. This is my major interest in, in this topic that I'm studying for the last decade or, or two. And I hope that after I will share with you my, my own reading, uh, we will have some kind of stimulating discussion here. You are invited to ask uh, questions. Because I, you know, in such a topic, I cannot cover all of the details. Um, so what interests me that you will ask not about the, this or that detail, but about the processes, about the consequences of this uh, topic. Well, as you may know, we in uh, the Holy Land, we have as many holy places as you have lakes in Minnesota. <laughs> Some of them I would swap with you, but never the weather. Uh, I would use two recent um, case studies, known to all of us because they are, they are frequently covered uh, by the news. Uh, there are sec central sacred sites, and um, I will bring in my own reading of uh, how I see the situation that takes place now in Jerusalem, and particularly regarding the shared uh, holy places. One of them is the Western Wall, central place for Jewish worship, and the other one is the Temple Mount, what the Muslims name Al-Haram al-Sharif or Al-Aqsa Mosque. The two of them are located in Jerusalem. As you know, Jerusalem is the cradle of uh, religions, Judaism, Christianity, and it is also the third holiest city for Islam. But at the same time, it was also, uh, I would say that in the past it was known as the, a venue or a symbol of interfaith, uh, interfaith dialogue and uh, interfaith cohabitation. And at the same time, it was also known as a venue of contestation and conflict. Unfortunately, in recent decades, Jerusalem's holiest places are employed for political ends. Yet, there are many records during medieval times of sharing intolerance in holy places in the Holy Land, with some exceptions. What went wrong in modern times? In my view, what went wrong is claiming sovereignty. Um, during the 400 years of Ottoman rule in Palestine, rights of access and worship were respected and they were distinguished from rights of ownership. As a minority denomination, if you respected the Muslim ownership of the land, you could maintain access and worship at many holy places. The tomb of Samuel, north of Jerusalem, is only one example. The Ottomans, who introduced the millet system, gave a significant degree of autonomy, that gave it significant degree of autonomy to non-Muslims, to the non-Muslim religious communities, um, also invented the status quo system. Following an intra-Christian dispute between the Latins and Greeks in the in mid 19th century, the Sultan maintained, uh, nominated a commission of inquiry with the aim not to be entangled his relationship with the European powers who supported this or that church in the Holy Land. Uh, his decree that followed this commission of inquiry created a status quo, meaning freezing of existing rights in disputed holy places, particularly in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. What was applied to only seven sites, uh, seven Christian sites, was later on expanded to other holy places, such as the Western Wall, the tomb of Rachel, at Bethlehem, and so on. The status quo system served for avoiding clashes and diffuse claims. But at the same time, it established the hegemony or exclusivity uh, at, uh, of, the, of the ruling majority. At that, at that time, it was the Muslim 
majority or a ruling majority in each of the sites that were shared. Yet the status quo discriminates against minority denominations that uh, keep their claims awaiting change of guards. Like when there is a new rule, they try to come back to power at the same shared holy place. Now the question is whether the status quo is a standstill situation, like I spoke about freezing the rights. Not at all, it is, dynam is, is dynamic. Due to political motivations or newly uh, arise challenges such as terror or, as, or congestion of visitors. Two examples. One is the recent uh, crisis of the metal detectors in, in the uh, entrance to the Haram Sharif, the Temple Mount area, um, which, uh, uh, you know, an, a terror action that resulted with the killing of two Israeli policemen Introduction of surveillance cameras and metal detectors uh, is required, but as I will underline later, it will depend on how do you introduce the change of the status quo. It depends how do you do it. Another more successful example is the Israeli police initiative to uh, place outdoor flat screens in front of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to broadcast the holy fire because of the conjunction, conjunction of, uh, of uh, visitors during that uh, event. Now, my first case of analysis is the Temple Mount or Haram. One could not expect that after 2,000 years of banning the Jews from their holiest place, Israel will resume this discrimination. When Israel broke, uh, when Israel took over uh, East Jerusalem in June 1967, the government opted to maintain the administration of the Haram in the hands of the Muslim Waqf. The Waqf authorities that are run by Palestinians, but they are subordinated and they are on the Jordanian payroll. But Israel also took over the keys to the Mugrabi Gate, one of the 10 gates to the Haram, in order to secure the visitation of non-Muslims uh, without uh, allowing the worship of Jews at the Haram. The government resolved the Jews who wished to pray at the Temple Mount would be ushered to do it at the Western Wall. This policy was backed by a chief rabbinate ruling that uh, Jews were, are prohibited from visiting the Temple Mount due to Jewish law rules. The Israeli police was assigned to control security in order at the site. This is a new post-1967 status quo that worked pretty well during the first 30 years after Israel took over East Jerusalem. The Muslims, uh, the Mus the Muslims could uh, live with this new situation by viewing Israel's occupation as temporary, uh, but an informal dialogue developed between the police and the Waqf, and the new status quo prevailed with continuous dialogue and a policy of, lit, of live and let live. However, in the last 30 years, there is a dramatic change that takes place and results with crisis at this site. The national religious streams among Jewish Israelis, many of them are settlers in the West Bank, decided to use the Temple Mount as a nationalist running point for claiming sovereignty, sovereignty over the entire land of Israel. The distinguished rabbis, rabbis challenged the 1967 chief rabbinate ruling by issuing their own halachic rule calling on every rabbi to ascend, I mean visit, uh, Jews do not visit the Temple Mount, they ascend to the Mount, to ascend by himself to the Temple Mount and guide his community followers to ascend according to their new interpretation of Jewish law. 
The activity shifted from the rabbinical front to the end uh, of, uh, of the Temple Mount uh, to the, uh, sorry, to the rabbinical front to the uh, political domain by connecting rabbis and um, members of Knesset, including ministers in the cabinet. They succeeded in the domain of public uh, consciousness. The majority of Israelis uh, today support visitation to the Temple Mount, but they justify the support by what they term as contribution to reinforce Israeli sovereignty at the Temple's site. This is an example of a political engineering of religious symbols. What interests the nationalists is not the right to express religious identity or devotion, but the nationalist aspirations of sovereignty. Due to the growing numbers of religious and ideological Jewish visitation to the Mount, the Muslims are afraid that Israel intends to divide the Temple Mount uh, compound between Jews and Muslims, as, it, as is the situation in Hebron at the cave of the patriarchs, what the, what the Muslims call uh, Al-Haram al-Ibrahimi, the Abrahamic shrine. On the other side of the aisle, there are the Islamists who claim that as long as the mosque is under Jewish control, it is in danger. They invoke incitement and terror and violence. Hence, there is an alliance between the extremists of both Muslims and Jews at shared holy places. But in spite of this, on a daily basis, the Muslim Waqf and the Israeli police coordinate in mutual tolerance and understanding the concerns of each other. A set of agreed upon understandings is under operation. I'll give you a few examples. First, the Temple Mount is not divided. It is shared. But in fact, a functional division takes place. There is Muslim administration and ushering and guarding inside the compound, while Israel is in charge of security and policing. Second, there are also agreed upon arrangements of Jewish visitation in, uh, uh, during des uh, designated hours and agreed upon visitation uh, conducts. It is also agreed that no Jewish worship or provocations, as they see it, are allowed and that the police enforces the rule of coordination with the Muslim waqf clerics. The two parties are also engaged in an ongoing dialogue and, and in order to prevent uh, clashes. My conclusion regarding the Temple Mount example are the following. First, separate between politics of sovereignty, ownership, and exclusive possession on the one hand, and religious devotion on the other hand. Jewish devotees could gain in the past and may gain in the future much more freedom of access and worship if they wouldn't claim sovereignty. Second conclusion is do not act unilaterally as was the case with the surveillance cameras and the metal detectors that took place last year. Uh, and, uh, and we have examples that when Israelis did not act unilaterally, but they coordinated and in a dialogue with the other party, it was a success. As an example, in 2005, nobody knows, but it was a lot of tension when Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip. And under this uh, uh, concern, the Israeli police, together with the Waqf authorities, managed to construct a security fence and surveillance cameras at the outer perimeter of the Temple Mount on the roofs of, uh, of the buildings, of the Muslim buildings in the neighborhood. And nobody knows about it because when you do it in dialogue, it doesn't uh, 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 instigate uh, counter action. Third, 
do all you can to maintain and preserve the post-1967 status quo that worked for 30 years, pretty well, as I said. Practically restrict the number of ideological visitors, uh, uh, ideological uh, visitors groups. In the past, every two or three uh, Jewish, uh, as I say, ideological visitors who used to visit the site would be uh, guarded by a policeman and a waqf guard. Today, nobody can inspect a group of 50 or 60 people, and in, in one case, in last, what was it, uh, nine of Ab, uh, uh, 200 people at once, and you cannot inspect and, and see that they are not provoking, like uh, trying to bend and to pray, where it is agreed upon that under the status quo, they should not do it. Uh, there is much more to conclude from this case, but if I will share with you all of it, uh, none of you is going to read my book, right? <laughs> now I would like to turn to my second uh, case study for tonight, the Western Wall. The wall was, and still is, disputed by Jews and Muslims. Um, but I would like today to discuss an intra-Jewish dispute, not between the Jews and the Muslims, but what happens between the Jews. And I hope for those of you who are aware with, with the facts that you had dinner before this lecture, and I will not cause some uh, stomach uh, um, um, ache for you with what I will say. Uh, because Jews were banned from approaching the destructed holy site, nobody knows exactly when did Jews start to pray in front of the wall. Some say during the 12th century, some say in the 16th century. Uh, the place was a pavement, a very modest pavement, three on 20 meters pavement, uh, used by Muslims and was surrounded by houses of North African institution of pilgrimage, which is known the Waqf Mugrabi uh, neighborhood. In 1967, when Israel developed the Western Wall as a substitute worship site to the Temple Mount, this included the demolish of the Mugrabi houses, paving a huge plaza in front of the wall, officially expropriating the wall the, pay, the plaza and the Jewish quarter, digging a tunnel along the wall, and conducting archeological excavations on, on the southern uh, side of the wall. The Western Wall was developed not only as a central place of worship for Jews uh, to substitute the Temple Mount, but also as a national convention site. Ceremonies take place during Memorial Days at this site, soldiers swore, swore in, and important international leaders pay visit to the wall as government guests. Now, the first debated issue regarding the wall was separation between men and women. Until World War I, Jewish prayer was mainly an individual lamentation with one exception during the ninth day of the month of Ab, which is considered to be the day where the first and second temple were destructed. Uh, until 1967, there was also no divider between men and women at the wall. There was one attempt during British mandate that caused the 1927 uh, turbulence in, in Palestine between Jews and Arabs around the issue of the, uh, bringing the divider and other compartments to the wall. Now, the second debate uh, was about who controls the wall. Is it the antiquities authority or the rabbis? Is, it, is the wall a remnant of history of antiquities or is it a place of worship that should be under the rabbis? Um, after deliberations at the cabinet in 1967, Prime Minister Levi Yeshko resolved to hand the site over to the administration of the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Due to political power of the religious party who controlled the ministry, uh, meaning that the uh, 
orthodox conduct was imposed on the wall, and a divider separated men and women. The size of the women's section was much smaller, as you can see in this picture, than men's one, as is the case in many uh, orthodox synagogues. Here again, like in the case of the Temple Mount that I described before, a dramatic change took place in, in recent years. 30 years ago, a group of women activists inspired by feminism, feminist ideology began a new conduct at the wall. Doing it once in a month, their message was revolutionary. We want to change the mindset of our society and to teach the Jewish world that women have the same rights and duties like men in religious worship. And we will change this perception, particularly in the strongest realm of conservativeness in the religious domain. We want to read from the Torah, to wrap ourselves with a prayer shawl, the talit, and uh, conduct the tefillin ceremony, the tefillin uh, ritual, like men. And that bat mitzvah ceremonies for girls will be the same as bar mitzvah of boys, meaningful with reading from the Torah. This was responded with a furious cry by the orthodox and especially the ultra-orthodox streams who used violence against the women of the wall. And since the rabbi of the Western Wall is an official civil servant, he invoked and used the police, and some say misused the police, um, to remove these women. Yet, the women of the wall employed the civil law and freedom of, freedom of uh, access and freedom of worship, uh, which explains why, at the end of the day, they came out victorious in court. The reform and conservative uh, streams, who are the majority in America but a minority in Israel, um, also demanded their stake at the wall. They didn't receive it for years. In the year 2000, the conservatives agreed, the reforms not, but only the conservatives agreed to be given a very small platform to conduct prayers with mixed congregation of men and women. After many deliberations, both the women of the wall and liberal streams were given an inferior place, inferior place to worship south of the historic wall, hidden from sight, let alone that this section is, is a part of the archaeological park there. The women of the wall confronted the government in the court and since the government failed to provide a decent place of worship, the court ruled that they have the right to the special way, to their own special way of worship, of prayer. Although it is clear that it offends the majority of Orthodox Jews. In other words, they succeeded to be recognized and in introducing a new status quo in the wall, not only orthodox prayer in the wall, but also uh, a different conduct that the women established in this wall, and it is the third decade, like 30 years, they are doing it every month, Read, reading with the Torah and so on. There was one exception. They could not read from, they could not bring in a Torah scroll they, uh, they had to read from the Torah in the inferior place, which is south of the historic wall, what is called the, Robin, the Robinson Arch or the uh, archaeological park. Um, in order to urge the authorities to solve their problem, the women of the wall smuggled small Torah scrolls inside their purse, as you see in this case of bat mitzvah of a girl, uh, to the women's section until the leaders were detained by the police, as you can see in this picture. The detentions enraged the American Jewry, who exerted pressure on the Israeli government to solve the problem of the women of the, women of the wall, but also of the liberal streams 
I mean the reforms and conservatives and some of the uh, modern orthodox in Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu maintained, uh, nomi sorry, not maintained, he nominated Nathan Sharansky, the chair of the Jewish agency, to find a solution. After negotiating with all stakeholders, he came with a plan to allocate the non-Orthodox uh, Jews and no, uh, a new Kotel, a new mall, south of the historic one, where the archaeological park exists, as you can see here, but on the same footing, meaning the same length, height, as you can see here in this slide, administration, they will be part of the administration of the, of the wall, and budget. Uh, then, Avichai Mandelblit, the secretary of the government at the time, was asked to study the plan and see how it could be implemented in consensus with the uh, orthodox and ultra-orthodox parties, uh, the coalition parties, of course. And the result was that uh, his plan was modest compared to the Sharansky plan, not the same size, not the same height, not the same whatever you want. Uh, but the liberal factions agreed to it because they were offered to share the administration trust to run the Kotel, meaning that they will be recognized and legitimized by the government as equal as the orthodox stream, at least in one domain which is the Kotel. Uh, they also believe that they will conduct bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah ceremonies, which will increase their popularity and, and reach out to the, to the, you know, to the even to the secular uh, community. The Mandelbrit plan is an example of dialogue and change of status quo through agreement of the relevant stakeholders meaning that each party had to agree to some compromises. Netanyahu brought in an, an architect, Michael Arad, who, by the way, uh, planned a Ground Zero Memorial, and he uh, designed this new uh, ramp in the same place, which is, in my eyes, still an inferior place. Um, and uh, it was agreed by the government that the government had a resolution to uh, execute this uh, plan. But six months after the government resolved to approve this plan, and when the ultra-Orthodox became more powerful in the government coalition, Netanyahu, out of fear to lose his coalition, um, had to put a hold on his own initiative. Not all the winner of the war agreed to the uh, plan of the government that the official leaders of the women, of this group of women, agreed to. They call themselves the original women of the wall, and they say, and they think that, that the women of the wall, as an organization, betrayed their original mission to impact the larger society. If you, if you pray in an inferior, uh, an inferior place, which is hidden off site, and uh, nobody sees you, so how can you impact the, the general community, and particularly the ultra-Orthodox and the Orthodox in, 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 um, in their conservative view, you know, to change their conservative uh, views. In the meanwhile, a platform, as you see in this picture, not as was planned, um, was constructed and signs with the text Azarat Israel, meaning the women's section, the, no, the section of Israel, of all Israel, meaning not the non-Orthodox sections, be they reforms, conservatives, modern Orthodox, seculars, everybody who is not Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox uh, was uh, implemented. And it looks, if you look at it, it from this angle, you see how ugly it looks like uh, today. And recently, a new plan, uh, recently a new plan uh, was introduced in order to expand the platform because Netanyahu is unable to, um, to materialize what he wanted before. He's trying to bypass his coalition parties and bringing it out to a, a different committee under the disguise 
of disabled accessibility. If we have disabled accessibility problem, we can expand the platform and satisfy the liberal uh, streams. Um, the reply by, by Minister Uri Ariel was, Prime Minister is not authorized to do anything because it belongs to the chief rabbinate. Minister Uri Ariel is a, is a member of the cabinet of the, you know, the Jewish uh, home party, uh, one of the orthodox, and he himself is one of the uh, provocators who goes to the Temple Mount, by the way, uh, to, to conduct some sort of worship and video cast it on, 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 on the internet. Um, so here we stand. Now, the real issue here is an orthodox attempt to block any involvement of the reforms and conservatives, particularly the reforms, in the Kotel uh, and undermine any official recognition of them. In closing, I began my presentation by asking the following question. How to prevent the outbreak of violent disputes and how to endorse tolerance in sacred sites revered by two or more religious denominations or religious groups. In my book, I developed a set of 15 conflict resolution methods that could be classified into four categories that you see here. First, preventive measures, such as conducting continuous dialogue with all stakeholders and refrain from using unilateral action. In the case of the women of the wall, the, uh, and later on uh, with the liberal streams, the government of Israel used dialogue, but only when pressure were exerted by the American jury and from bottom up in uh, Israel. The second set of methods is dispute controlling methods, such as transparency, and um, uh, plans, transparency of plans and works and so on. The third set of methods is dispute uh, treatment and mitigation, such as mediation, professional committee, to nominate a professional committee to study the, the, the facts, court hearing, all of them were used in the case of the, of the wall. Some of them were used too late. And finally, Methods of conflict resolution. Basically, we can identify three patterns of conflict resolution in shared holy places. One is time sharing in the same space. The second is space sharing and the division. And the third is expanding the holy place and reallocation it. In the case of the women of the wall, time sharing is the current situation invoked by the women because they, as you see this yellow uh, square here, they, they used to pray inside the women's section but in a, in a special group surrounded today by policemen to protect them from the, from the ultra-orthodox uh, groups. This is the current situation with, that uh, didn't work. Um, expanding the holy space and reallocating it uh, is a creative idea of conflict resolution in my mind. It is how to, to slice the cake and keep it complete. The only disadvantage with the newly constructed Kotel in, in its uh, current uh, inferiority regarding the historical wall is the current inferiority regarding the historic wall and the fact that it is hidden from sight. Therefore, I am pointing out a new possibility that was never considered due to the objection of the Orthodox. Space sharing at the upper plaza, as you see in this case here. And why do I propose this? In this place, men and women mingle today. And you are still praying in front of the wall in front of the historic wall and not in the inferior section of the wall. You are visible and also you do not cause harm to the archaeological park by constructing ugly metal and wooden platforms and, and conducting bar mitzvah and, and developing into like a, a festive hall. 
and in, in, in all of what uh, entails. If the ultra-Orthodox groups will disagree, the government can always exclude uh, this limited space from the responsibility of the rabbi in charge of the wall. It is possible because, as I said before, uh, the, the whole space was expropriated by the government. So the government can de 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 decide that this space, which is not part of the regular wall now because it is the upper plaza, could be designated for, for the others who want to pray in, in, in an equal prayer. My analysis from previous conflict resolution of uh, disputes at holy places show that a responsible government has to use its carrots and sticks with the relevant religious groups in order to bring them into an agreement. Under the current government, any change, of, uh, uh, any, any change in favor of the modern and liberal Jewish streams seems unlikely to happen. But one can envision a coalition without the ultra-Orthodox parties that will have the capacity to create such a change. And with this happy remark, I thank you. And can I take uh, questions and answer now? Please. Uh, who's going to be the second here? Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, especially significant, the remarks are especially significant because we can now visualize more clearly what we're talking about. Uh, I'm curious, you, you, you talked in some detail about the cooperation and the management, the civic situation at the top of the Temple Mount. Is there similar cooperation across the rest of the old city of Jerusalem? And the second question, for some of your Can you repeat is, the first question? Is this what? Is there similar cooperation when it comes to the administration and management of affairs across the rest of the old city? And secondly, in some of the models of conflict resolution you're talking about, could they be generalized to other, to other areas as well? So thank you very much. Uh, one by one uh, yeah. response yeah. is, is yeah. the, okay. So two questions, one is, uh, I'm sorry. The first, for the first question, uh, if there is cooperation around, you know, the situation in Jerusalem is not so easy. Uh, at the holiest place, because everybody is aware of the delicacy and, and the tense situation that exists, they have to cooperate. They have to cooperate. And, and the stakeholders, be they the Muslims or the Israelis, have to consider this cooperation and, and continuous dialogue. Of course, among each of the two parties, there are radicals who disrupt the, you know, the agreement and they try to provoke and, uh, you know, uh, um, but in the, in the outer circle, today, I, I believe that uh, we have cooperation, I mean we, Israelis, have cooperation from the Palestinians surrounding the Temple Mount, particularly from the shopkeepers, the, the, those who are in the tourist uh, industry around. And what you have in the old, you know, as a visit, recent visitor to Jerusalem, Richard, you know that, the, um, that a, lot, a lot of tourists and, uh, and uh, most of the old city is a huge touristic site because every stone speaks volumes about the history of the land. And uh, so there, there is a, a shared um, interest of both Israelis and Palestinians. I mentioned the example of the tomb of Samuel, where it's the only place in the world where you have a, sin, a, a mosque functioning on top of a synagogue of, of the cave where the cenotaph of Samuel is believed to, to be there. So Jews and Muslims co cohabitate together there and some other places. So it is, and if, even if you take a place which is uh, known for many frictions, which is the Cave of the Patriarchs, one of the ancient places of worship in, in Palestine, um, 
People believe that Abraham, the Muslims also believe that, that Adam is, is buried there. Isaac and Jacob and the wives are buried there. And uh, well, there were a lot of frictions, and still are frictions around because of the settlers, the Jewish settlers in Hebron and so on. But in the place, it's in the holy site itself. It is today actually space divided between Jews and, and, and Muslims. By the way, the Muslims afraid that this is the intention of Israel is to do it the Temple Mount as well. Once I had a dialogue with a Muslim sheikh. He was a Hamas, you know, a terrorist uh, a leader, and then he switched to the Fatah, to the PA, to the Palestinian Authority. His name is uh, Jamil Hamami, Sheikh Jamil Hamami, and I asked him, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, when a group of Christians came to uh, visit him in uh, Al Madina. He uh, hosted them in his mosque, and when they had to go to pray, he said, you can pray here in my mosque. So there is no restriction or prohibition for others to pray in a mosque. So why don't you allow Jews to pray in your holy site? Had you allow it, it would make it easier to cater to the Israeli Jews to establish an agreement you know, between Pal Pal the Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, like, as I said before, separate between sovereignty and the freedom of worship. His answer was the following. He said, you know, we have no problem with you Jews praying in our holy places. We have only one problem, your political conduct. After 1967, we gave you a finger at the cave of the patriarchs, meaning that they, there was an agreement of the mayor, between the mayor of Hebron and Moshe Dayan, the Minister of Defense of Israel, uh, that Jews will, will uh, be given a small uh, um, corner to pray inside the compound. It's a huge compound, which is a huge, used to be a huge mosque. And gradually, when the Jewish settlers came to Hebron and Kiryat Arba, they expanded it on, at the expense of the Muslims, and today it is divided more or less 50-50. A Isaac Hall is a mosque, and Jacob and Abraham Hall is, a, is a, a synagogue. And the court, the open court between them, which is now covered. Um, in this case, in 1994, there was a brutal and very uh, um, catastrophic, I would say, uh, event when a Jewish uh, settler came and shot down 29 uh, Muslims there. But following this crisis, and since then, so we, we are 24 years after this, there are, there are no incident because they found that they should not let people with gun go in. And other uh, agreement around it, and I participated in, a, in a meetings between the Muslims and Jews who administer the site, the two places of the site, and they have to agree on every slight repair, like if there is um, you know, um, a water tap which, which is broken, the authority to approve the repair is in the Israeli side, the Minister of, of Defense, and in the Palestinian side, the chairperson of the Palestinian Authority, Abu Mazen. Uh, but they, agree, they succeed to agree, and, there are, and, and, and they cooperate. And 10 days, imagine, the 10 days in a year, the, in the high holidays of Jews, the Muslims roll out the rugs, the prayer rugs, and store them, and the entire compound becomes a synagogue, and Muslims do not pray there. And in the 10 days of high holidays of Muslims, the Jews take off the benches and store them, and it is an, an entire compound is a mosque. And if and what and you can ask, what happens if the high holidays match? Because you know the calendar, the Muslim calendar. So they, they agree between eight and four, our turn between four and eight, your turn, or something like this, and it works. So this goes to your uh, second question about if you can expand this uh, methodology to other places. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really interested in the comments uh, about Sodom and the end and the growth of that and the ability to cooperate. And you have a new nation state going on now, the basis of the state of Israel. And I'm wondering, uh, it, it seems like that's going to be supercharged in the Sodom and the aspect of things that are in there. 
Okay, thank you. Well, the national law uh, is, on the one hand, it's it's not it's not a uh, um, it's not an uh, let's say an uh, um, operational law. It's nothing really uh, uh, affects the nothing affects the reality on the ground, even not uh, in, in the status of, of the Arabic language, because it is still uh, functioning as it was before. And it is particularly an, uh, you know, a declarative law. It's a declarative law. Uh, in my eyes, I criticize it. I disagree with it. I think it is uh, redundant and just uh, uh, makes the situation more complicated. But it has nothing to do with issues of holy places, nothing at all. Because what we have in Israel regarding the holy places is the law of protection of holy places, which was enacted in 1967. Under this law, the women of the wall were able to go and file the, their case in the court and demand freedom of access and freedom of worship, and they won. The court recognized their right to come and, and pray according to, to their own way of prayer, you know. Yes, please. Ramification of? Of the movement of the embassy or the embassy, oh. <laughs> things like that. This is outside, outside of the scope of my talk today. <laughs> but I pub since I published an article about it, and it is available on, on the web, but I'm also a researcher at the Jerusalem Institute for, it is now called Jerusalem Institute for Policy Research. Um, I, can, uh, I can tell you that, uh, at the beginning, everybody was uh, at the opinion that it will, um, it will hamper the ability to reach uh, peace with the Palestinians because they are, they expressed, they expressed that they are being offended, they're, they're, they expressed they're angry at this, uh, but you know, um, nobody knows exactly what comes with it. On the one hand, Donald Trump, President Trump said that uh, you know, we now remove Jerusalem off the table. On the other hand, he said it will not have any ramification on the future of the agreement between Israelis and Palestinians. So you don't know. And, and in another opportunity, he said that uh, that he will he's going to charge the Israelis with high price for giving them this uh, gift of moving moving the embassy. I believe that the, you know uh, there, there is. I don't see any possibility that uh, a negotiation will take place in the Middle East without Amer the United States of America. So they cannot ban or boycott or refuse to go to the table of negotiation. I don't. I don't think so. In the end, it, it all depends on the details. It also it depends on who is in charge in each of the administrations. The personalities are very important. I'm not speaking only about America. I speak also about the Palestinians and the Israelis. I, no, but no one knows who will come and replace Mahmoud Abbas. He's, he's not in good health, and I wish him good health, but he's not, and, and, uh, and also um, not so young. And nobody knows who will come after, who will replace him. So uh, it depends a lot on the personality, on the, ideology of those, of those who will be in charge and, and the timing, you know, and circumstances around. So we have to wait and see. There is a question there. Who will replace me? <laughs> Not me, certainly. Once, I remember, it reminds me that an American ambassador visited uh, the Hebrew University when I was at the Hebrew University. Uh, I think it was Dan Kertzer at the time. And uh, I said something like, uh, "Had I be, had I be the, um, had I be the prime minister, or had I be the American diplomat, or something like this, uh, I would say that uh, 
that we have to, to have a, a strong crisis, like a catastrophe, you know, not, not the, like the hurricane, like, but we have to have some strong crisis in order to, to come out and you and to, to come to overcome it, like, and start things from the, from the beginning in order to, you know, to conduct an agreement between the parties. And his response was, well, that is why you will not be, so it's not me. Who knows? I don't think, I, if you ask me personally, I, I, I think that he's very popular and I, I don't see, unless he will be, uh, you know, charged and convicted at court, uh, I don't see anybody else uh, in the politi political map today that can replace him. So it was like a statement, not more than a question, isn't it? Yes, please. There are forces that move the There are forces that move towards the solution that you propose. And there are forces that can you can, can you put it uh, uh, yeah yeah this way is there, there are forces I you that move uh, to oppose the solution you propose. Uh, some of those sources come from inside It. You know, I'm involved in uh, different circles um, in track to diplomacy between Israelis and Palestinians on the one hand. Uh, I'm not, uh, frankly speaking, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, an admirer of the current government, but I still have my contacts and the work that we conduct, the research work that we conduct, which is, some of it is applied research at the institute we share with the government. Uh, like I, with a recent book, another book, not this one that I showed you here, um, in, in, the, in a recent book that I published about the status quo at the Temple Mount, I was invited by the National Security Council at the Prime Minister's office to present it. And they were surprised. Some of the basic facts they were not aware of. They were not aware of, particularly that they, they never and unfortunately, I have to say it, the, the government never made an attempt to understand the reading of the other side, to understand the motivation, to understand how they see it. And, uh, and they were really surprised, and, and I believe that uh, some of it was, gr was grappled by them and conveyed to the upper echelons. And uh, i give you one example um, recently I had, uh, the, we had a conference and one of those who are uh, uh, proponents of, or advocates of visitation, Jewish visitation, visitation to the Temple Mount, his name is Nadav Shagai, he's a journalist at Makor Ishon, and, uh, which is a right-wing uh, outlet and, uh, and he's also, he also comp uh, wrote a, a book about the, the Temple Mount. And, um, and we discussed the issue and he said, you know, if we will be able to negotiate with the Muslims that they will give us really a modest corner at the site, I believe that we will uh, be able to influence our uh, religious nationalist groups not to push to what they are advocating, which is to rebuild the third temple in place of the Dome of the Rock, as an example. So there are some, as I said before, uh, there is, as it was during the Ottoman period, you have to have a strong government that knows what they want and is using all of their capacities, be they carrots on the one hand or sticks on the other hand in order to to bring all of the parties to 
the table of negotiation and, and try to tear something out of it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, of course, of course. In the book, I have a number of cases. Uh, I mean, the Western Wall is intra-Jewish, and uh, I speak about one case, at least, uh, in Nazareth. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the Shihab, Shihab al-Din affair in Nazareth. It was in 1997 when Israel planned a huge plaza in front of the Church of Annunciation just before the millennium visit of the Pope. In order to uh, prepare the uh, plaza for more pilgrims and make it more respected for the visit of the Pope, and it had to demolish a Muslim school, which was not in use at all. But the Muslim community demonstrated uh, they wanted to uh, undermine the, the project because it was, you know, Nazareth is this, you know, the city of Jesus Christ. And um, in the past, it was uh, predominantly Christian, but today, today, like Bethlehem, it is predominantly Muslim. So the Muslim want to influence the, the skyline of the, of, the, of the city and they wanted instead of the plaza to build a huge mosque that its minaret will overlook the church and will have the verse, you know, there are some verses in the Quran that say, uh, that speak against the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. Uh, like, Allahu ahad lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufuan wahad. I'm citing it from the Quran in Arabic now. And, uh, and the unfortunately, the Israeli government didn't want to intervene between in, in, in the crisis, but after a number of years, after six years of dispute, uh, and, and the Muslims uh, forcefully transgressed the plaza and constructed a basement of the mosque until the Israeli authorities stopped them. And there was a, also, it was uh, uh, taken to the court and uh, only after uh, George Bo W. Bush um, spoke with Ariel Sharon, who in the meantime became uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Israel had to demolish the basement and to, um, and to construct the plaza. But it was after the Pope visited Nazareth, and the Pope visited, uh, visit, visit to Nazareth was not uh, is what was not respectful as everybody expected it to be. It was not good to Nazareth. It was not good to the Muslims who, who make the living from tourism in Nazareth, you know? And nowadays there are still some frictions like uh, the plaza is, um, is, a, is a, you know, it's a, just a public plaza to um, adore the, the church in front of it. But in, on Fridays, Muslims are coming and they are covering it like a tent, the plaza, and they pray just to say to everybody, you know, we, are, we will still have our claim to this place. So it's one chapter describing it in my book. If you are interested, you are more, more, more than welcome to, to read it. Yes. Regarding the third build, the, the the movement that wants to to uh, build the third temple, yeah. yeah. And here, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I must say that it is a tiny group. It's not a huge group. But you know, you need only one provocator in such a, such a sensitive place with, uh, with one provocation that can instigate a whole fire. Like, you know, in 1969, 21st of August 1969, perhaps there are among you those who remember it, an Australian Messianic Christian named Michael Dennis Rohan came to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, which is south of the Dome of the Rock, with uh, a gallon of, of gasoline, spread it on their rugs and light the fire. And it was, you know, the, the whole mosque was set to fire. Uh, the pulpit, the preaching pulpit, which was a wooden, extraordinary uh, furniture, which was brought by Saladin in the 12th century from Halab in, in Syria to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, after Palestine was liberated from the Crusaders, um, was burned to ashes. And, uh, and it, you need only one, you know, pro, pro, you know, one provocation to uh, create a real uh, dangerous crisis in, in this side. And I, uh, uh, in my uh, deliberations with the gov government officials, I always, uh, I always uh, warn them from such situation because some of the members of the Knesset and the Israeli cabinet are part of these provocators. I, I can give you names, and they are on the newspapers. You don't have, you don't need me to do this. And so far, the prime ministers, the prime minister of Israel, after I believe that after uh, strong pressure from John Kerry at the time, uh, minister of uh, State Department, uh, secretary of State Department, um, he succeeded and succeeds to, uh, to restrict them, not to visit and not to do some provocations, but it's only a matter of time. Who knows what will happen during the, the primaries, um, elections in the Likud party, in the ruling party. Because, you know, uh, in the primaries, in order to be elected to the, to the party, you have to cater also, also to these groups who are not so, uh, not so strong uh, in, in quantity, but they are very well organized and they can influence the result of the primaries. So everybody is walking on a very, uh, on a type of, you know, when, when, they, when they are uh, speaking about the, the Temple Mount. So, but luckily so far he is able to, uh, to play it down. I hope it will last and wisdom will prevail. Yes, uh, Carol. And then you. Yeah. Oh, you. Okay. okay. Can you just speak up? No, no, you can speak up into the microphone. Yeah. Okay. So this is okay. This is okay. Since we got back on last Sunday, Saturday from Israel, yeah. we've kind of been obsessed with Israel because we've watched five videos thinking about it. And one of them was called The Settlers. And one of the fanatics was interviewed and said that your absolute goal was to blow up the um, Dome of the Rock. And some other expert that someone mentioned that if there was anything in the world about the settlers. If the settlers succeeded in blowing up the Dome of the Rock somehow, even though you said you know, there's control of mm -hmm. access, who thought who would have thought that yep. the World Trade Center would be attacked by people with airplanes? Yes, I understand, it, okay. It just I think it's just terrifying. Okay. Uh, I spoke about the Israeli government, but there is also the Israeli police. 
The police is like a different government from the government. Uh, if you I interviewed the, the commander of the Jerusalem police as an example, and he said, we have, no, we have no instruction from the government. We do what we understand on the field. Nobody is, is really uh, telling us what to do. This is on the one hand. And we, uh, what we understand is that we have to use dialogue and the policy of live and let live, okay? Uh, and in the case of the settlers and what happens with the Dome of the Rock, uh, today, Israelis are not, not only Israelis, non-Muslims are not allowed to enter and visit the, the shrine, not allowed to visit not the Dome of Rock and not the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It happened after the Ariel Sharon as, as Likud chair, not prime minister yet, a visit in 2000, he visited the, uh, the site and there was uh, a huge uh, riots broke out after this, and for three years the, the Temple Mount was was closed to any visitation of non-Muslims. And then, when they opened it up unilaterally by Israel, by the way, uh, they don't let people go into the Dome of the Rock and the, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And the Israeli police today is, I would say, the only reasonable um, authority around that understands and is in a continuous dialogue with the, with the local Palestinians, and Jordanians, and Muslims to, to keep the situation calm and not to uh, allow any disruption or any, any problem, from, not from the settlers or from another uh, segment. But that said, I must, I must say, let us remember that every organization has some politics. And there is also politics within the Israeli police. Uh, if as a, is, as a commander, if you are a commander of the district and you wish to be nominated, to be uh, promoted, to be the chief of staff of the police, you have to consider this or that policy when, when you are also in regards to, not only to the Temple Mount, to what happens in Jerusalem in its entirety. So, it's complicated. That's why I dedicate my research recently to holy places because I believe that holy places are not regular territories to be debated. You have to be an expert in so many fields in order to understand how to mitigate the situation and, and prevent uh, the outbreak of violence in, in such places. Your question. Yes, um, you probably are the best equipped to answer this question. My understanding is that from the time that Israel became a state in 1948 until 1967, when there was free war and there was war on Israel, that uh, neither Jews nor Christians could visit the holy sites. Is that true? That we prevent Christians from visiting? That, from, that, that Jews and Christians were prevented from 1948 until the war in 1967. Is that true? You remind, reminded me something very interesting when I spoke about the Temple Mount. This is not, re, not to refer to your question, but you just remind me that uh, Israel, uh, not Israel, the Jewish people in Palestine before Israel was established, never demanded access to the Temple Mount. In the 1920s, they demanded to expand their rights of ritual at the Western Wall because the Western Wall was considered to be the real, subst or like, the, like representing the temple where according to Jewish halacha, Jewish law, you are not allowed to, uh, to step on. And it was not in the 1920s, not in the 1930s when the Peel Commission investigated the situation in Palestine, and not in, even in, not in 48, you spoke about 48, not even in 48. What was uh, in 48 was uh, agreed upon in the Rhodes Agreement of 1949, actually, following the war, was that there will be a special committee 
Jordanian Israeli committee, it was the agreement between Israel and Jordan, that will have, that will uh, uh, make some special arrangements of freedom of access of Israelis to their holy places, meaning mainly the, mainly the, mainly the Western Wall. But this committee did not materialize somehow. So Jews were not, they were banned, as I said before, they were banned to go to Christians, you know, uh, the old city was under Jordanian rule. And the John Jones, I, I kept the status quo strictly. They even helped. I have to, uh, to uh, praise them because they helped uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Church of the Holy Sepulchre is being, uh, uh, I have also a chapter about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, is, uh, is split between six different Christian denominations who are contesting each other about every corner. If this wall is belonging to the Orthodox and this one to the Armenians, they will, they will disagree about the, you know, the edge of, of the, between the two walls, who is responsible of it. And, and the Jordanians managed in a, in a wise way to create a technical committee, which is like a professional committee. Let's remove things from politics and put architects and engineers to agree about the renovation. And, and they, by this way, they saved the Holy Sepulchre from dilapidation. Okay, so uh, Christians were, were still, I mean, Christians uh, were respected, but, and there was the Mandelbaum gate, there was a special gate between Jordanian Jerusalem and Israeli Jerusalem that the uh, clergy, the Christian clergy could move from one side to the other to visit their holy places, but Jews could not do it because it was still, you know, uh, um, not a, a peaceful situation at that time. Still, there were some cases of snipers from the Jordanian side to the Israeli. I, I, I lived actually 100 meters from the wall of Musrara at the Mamila neighborhood, where, and I remember as the age of six that they used to, uh, we were afraid that the snipers will shoot at our neighborhood. But luckily, we have peace today with Jordan, so we are good friends, not just peace. What happens in archaeology if an artifact is discovered? Who has claim to it? The land, the artifact, the museum? Such a good question. So many good questions you have here in this. Uh, audience, um, archaeology. Archaeology today is inspected by the Israeli Archaeology Authority. There is one exception. At the Temple Mount itself, since the Waqf has the authority of administration, if they want, they cooperate with the Israeli authorities, and if they do like a, a public work, like if they have to dig a tunnel and to put like a new electricity cable or water facility or fire facility, as they, as they do on, 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 a day, on an ongoing basis. Uh, they used to uh, call the, the authority of antiquities to come and inspect in, in co It was part of the status quo cooperation that we had for the first 30 years after 1967. In 1996, when there was another riot, because Israel, part of this excavation, opened a new exit to the Western Wall Tunnel, uh, and the Palestinians uh, resented it, and, and resulted with the killing of 15 Israelis and so on, so the cooperation ceased. They did not continue this cooperation, and uh, as part of it, they uh, constructed a new mosque on the basement of, of uh, in the surface, what, you, what was called the Solomon's Tables during the uh, Crusader era. And, uh, and with their works that they did, they took out 100,000 tons of earth out of it, throwing it in a garbage place uh, without even uh, checking its, uh, you know, uh, its, uh, its uh, content. 
And so the Israeli authorities had to uh, nominate a special committee of archaeologists to go and to filter it out. And they, they have a lot of, of findings. Some of them are very important. Uh, some of them are not so important, but they are presented as, you know, uh, particularly uh, um, uh, underlying, you know, the Jewish history of the place and so on as a proof because, you know, there was no, never there was no excavation under the holy site, only in, in its uh, outer environs. And I believe that many Israeli Jews, under the process of Muslim denial of the Jewish attachment to the site, and there is a strong, there is a strong movement, a strong uh, uh, a trend of denying the Israeli attach the Jewish attachment and the Christian attachment to the holy site, to the Temple Mount. Um, so there are many uh, Jewish Israelis who aspire that we will find you know, like strong evidence that to show them here, you can see we have remnants, we have uh, artifacts, archaeological artifacts that show that we, we were here once, you know. It's part of the, you know, uh, contested uh, narratives uh, and history that we have in, in this uh, region. We could go on all night, but unfortunately we can't, so we'll take one last question. Last one, okay. Um, so Harvard's negotiation project. So Harvard's negotiation project brings together a group of Palestinian and group of uh, Israeli. Jews Capacity to build? To who has the capacity to develop these kinds of uh, solutions that you propose to um. build the agreement and to <laughs> Well, the capacity is at the hand of the of the leadership, the political leadership on all sides. But my activity is aimed at developing a bottom-up understanding. Um, we are working with a small group of Palestinians. Some of them are influential today. Some of them were influential in the past. We're working uh, with Jordanians, and we try to reach some uh, agreements. As an example, the first important issue is to agree about the history of the place, to agree about that we will have like a joint factual narrative that doesn't deny, not only doesn't deny the role of the other, but also respect the history of, of the other. And, uh, and we have some uh, Palestinians and Jordanians who agree with us and we can work together. Now the challenge is how to bring in from, from bottom up to the to the leadership it's not so easy it's not so easy but you know i'm, a, I'm an optimist so i keep working on it Let's see. Thank you.